Oh, wow. We've got people coming from North Carolina, Washington State, Ohio, upstate New York, Alabama. Not as many people as I thought from uh, Georgia. There we go. Oh, there's some Atlantans. Fantastic. I see some people from Australia. Yeah. Wow. Tell them to yeah. go to bed. Go to bed, you Australia. Yeah, I know. I was... <laughs> uh, from Mercer University here in uh, Georgia. Ah, look at this. Oh, wait, Connecticut, Long Island, Wisconsin, Nova Scotia. Let's go ahead and get started. Uh, cognizant of our time, and we want to give Dr. Uh, Vaughn plenty of time to talk. So welcome to our uh, webinar series, Spotlight on Structured Literacy. My name is Kim Day, and I'm Vice President of IDA Georgia Board of Directors. And on behalf of the board, we're pleased to be offering this series. This marks IDA Georgia's second year uh, working in collaboration with Reading League Georgia. We're very pleased uh, this exciting partnership continues. I wanna give a special thanks to Nicole Vela, the Reading League Georgia's president, and Dr. Jennifer Lindstrom, also a board member of IDA Georgia. They'll be supporting the webinar this evening by monitoring the chat box for questions and also facilitating the Q&A with Dr. Vaughn. I also wanna thank uh, other IDA Georgia board members who worked with these webinars together. Uh, in the interest of time, I won't list all of your names. Uh, you know who you are, and um, I thank you for all of your help and support behind the scenes. The webinars would not be possible without your, your help. The International Dyslexia Association and the Reading League of Georgia are committed to providing information on evidence-based practices to educators, parents, and advocates. In doing so, we hope all students will have access to structured literacy instruction. In this four-part series, our speakers uh, will be discussing how to most effectively instruct reading uh, based on the science of instruction and what content to include to ensure that students become competent readers and writers. The first speaker in the series was Dr. Anita Archer. She focused her presentation on joining the science of reading with the science of instruction. This evening's speaker is Dr. Sharon Vaughn. Dr. Vaughn will be talking about the science of reading comprehension. Before we begin, I keep delaying, before we begin, uh, thank you to those who submitted questions when you registered for the webinar. As a reminder, if you have other questions, please put them in the chat box. As I mentioned already, uh, the chat will be monitored and Dr. Vaughn will address as many of your questions during the Q&A as she's able to. And now, without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce this evening's speaker, though she needs little introduction as her reputation and research are known and valued by so many educators across the country and beyond. Dr. Vaughn is a professor at the University of Texas and is the Manuel uh, Justes, uh, I hope I pronounced that correctly, Endowed Chair in Education and the Executive Director of the Meadows Center for Preventing Educational Risk an organized research unit that she founded with a Make-A-Wish gift from the Meadows Foundation family. She is the recipient of numerous awards, including the first woman in the university, uh, in the history of the University of Texas to receive the Distinguished Faculty and Research Award, the CEC Research Award, the AERA SIG Distinguished Researcher Award, and the Jeanette uh, Fleshner Award for Outstanding Contributions in the Field of Learning Disabilities from the Council for Exceptional Children. She is the author of more than 40 books and 350 research articles. Dr. Vaughn is currently the principal investigator on several Institute for Education Sciences, National Institute for Child Health and Human Development, and the U.S. Department of Education Research Grants. She works as a senior advisor to the National Center on Intensive Interventions um, and has more than six articles that have met the What Works Clearinghouse criteria for their intervention reports. Dr. Vaughn has conducted technical assistance and literacy to more than 10 countries and 30 state departments of education and has worked as a literacy consultant to more than 50 technical assistance projects. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sharon Vaughn. Oh, thanks. Gosh, that was great. So um, I guess I better share my screen, right? There we go. Is that working for everybody? Can you all see it all right? Fantastic. Okay, well, first of all, thank you all so much for letting me be here. What 
an incredible opportunity to speak to so many people. For those of you that are giving up dinner, oh, that is impressive. I hardly ever miss a meal. For those of you in Australia and other places, you're probably getting up at the break of dawn. Very impressive. I also want to recognize my colleague in Georgia, Elizabeth Stevens, who's at Georgia State University, whose research on main idea and summarization has really provided a very significant influence about the science of reading. So um, I also want you to just take a minute and ask yourself this question. What does it mean to um, have strong reading comprehension? What do we mean? So in your own head, one or two words, or if you feel like it, drop it in the chat box. Although I'm afraid nobody can see the chat box. Um, let's see if we can do something about that. But think about what does reading comprehension mean? So I don't know about you, but for me, reading comprehension means two things. Understanding, learning. Of course, it's much bigger than that. But really, if we comprehend text, we understand it and we can learn from it. And I'm not going to spend much time on this because most of you know about the simple view of reading. But what most people don't understand is that it's word reading, or what some people call decoding, multiplied by linguistic comprehension. And that's reading comprehension. So just really simply... What do we mean by word reading? And what do we mean by linguistic comprehension? I'm just gonna explain them very quickly. The famous Scarborough rope, impossible to talk about reading development without talking about it. But really, when we talk about word reading, if you look at the bottom before you get to the rope, it says word recognition and it says phonological awareness, decoding and sight words. If you look at linguistic comprehension, you can see it's background knowledge, vocabulary, language structures, verbal reasoning, and literacy knowledge. So it's really those two things. And the reason it's multiplicative is because it relates to the fact that if you have nothing but linguistic comprehension, but you don't have word reading, you will not get reading comprehension. And if you only have word reading, like I do in Spanish, I have really good word reading, but my linguistic comprehension is so weak that my reading comprehension is poor. That is the whole story. My presentation is over. No, just kidding. But comprehension is complex, even though it looks simple with those two processes, because it's the process of simultaneously extracting and constructing meaning. The constructing part really comes from background knowledge. And background knowledge is necessary because if you're reading about something like black holes in physics and you don't have adequate background knowledge, the fact that in general you have good word reading and good linguistic comprehension, without that background knowledge, you will not be able to understand written language. So it really consists of these three elements, the reader, the text, and the purpose or the engagement for reading. And here's something I want to say. We are all involved in the science of reading. We are involved in understanding it. We're involved in putting it in action in our classrooms and in our schools. And if we're not, we should be ashamed of ourselves because we really know a lot about teaching reading. And so when I talk about the science of reading comprehension, the thing I want to be sure I emphasize is that word study is essential. Word reading, the foundation skills are fundamental. It's this active processing that cannot occur unless the reader can recognize individual words reliably and efficiently. That's why decoding is so important. But we don't want to be in this position as people who understand the science of reading, where we begin to be thought of as phonicators who only think of reading as word reading or phonics or phonological awareness. Essential, but not sufficient. So yes, that is part of the science of reading, a necessary part of the science of reading. 
a necessary part of comprehension, but inadequate. And it's because of the multiplicative uh, role of the, of the simple view of reading in which we need linguistic comprehension. Now, here's the thing. You can go away from this presentation with these two ideas that are really important. For the most part, if you are a parent, especially of a parent of a, a youngster with dyslexia, what you have probably observed is that word reading or decoding is insufficiently taught and that reading comprehension is overtaught. You may have seen that. And if you have, don't think to yourself, well, reading comprehension instruction means that my child is going to be a better able to understand what they read. Uh-uh, no. The reason is, is because most of what goes on, or maybe just much of what goes on in the name of reading comprehension instruction are inadequate approaches that do not align with the science of reading. So we're going to do that tonight. We're going to take a lens on, on reading comprehension. But again, it's not because word reading and decoding are not essential. So let me just say one more thing. Background knowledge, background knowledge and vocabulary. Really, vocabulary is kind of a proxy for background knowledge. It sort of tells you about background knowledge has a major impact on reading comprehension. It's correlated with higher scores on reading comprehension measures, regardless of the student's reading proficiency or regardless of the child's grade level. And the correlation is about 0.66. So background knowledge is important. And what that means is we need to build background knowledge. Now, how is it that you will see background knowledge being built much of the time in classrooms? you will see it built by people asking questions like this. All right, I'm a third grade teacher and I'm trying to build background knowledge and we're reading about igloos in uh, Northern Canada. And when we read about igloos in Northern Canada, I'm building background knowledge and I ask this question, what do you know about this topic? Please don't let your teachers do this. Please don't do that. And the reason is, is because this is what happens. Very few people in the class know anything about igloos, right? So the teacher says to build background knowledge, what do you know about igloos? And so like eight kids raise their hands, some of them really strongly raising and waving, wanting to get attention. And you call on one of them and the student says, um, one time I saw an igloo on a show and the igloo was there. And then I talked about it and, and then we, I wanted to see another igloo. So now, what do the students know about igloos? Nothing. Okay, they still know nothing. Then another kid say, says, is igloos the same thing as ugly? I think it's the same thing as ugly. So now we are confusing things. We have some people saying things that are incorrect. And usually the teacher doesn't take time to fix that. And so students in the room now have this hodgepodge of information, some of it correct, some of it not. No one has background knowledge. So don't do that. And if your children's teachers are doing that, ask them not to do that. What we want to do is we want to build background knowledge by talking about the big idea of the unit. Look at this picture of the igloo. We want to connect to prior learning. We want to select like a video clip that lasts one minute on about an igloo. I just quickly show it. A graphic organizer that shows a picture of an igloo and how it relates to other things that relate to igloos, such as the people that live in them, the uh, uh, flora and fauna around igloos. We explain the concept and we ask questions. So we build background knowledge by building back background knowledge, not by asking kids questions they don't know the answers to that confuse them. So as part of this um, text uh, preview of building background knowledge, you can see I've got Anita Archer uh, referenced who was part of your um, presentation last time. She is so amazing. And I hate following her because she's like the best presenter in the whole world. 
But in terms of building background knowledge, you want to spend some time previewing text. You want to complete an outline that might include the title or the heading or some questions. You might learn about the topic. You might ask students to work in pairs and to do some critical information to prepare for what they're going to read. The second really important thing you want to do, let me just look at this chat really quickly. What's going on here in the chat? Oh, I can't really see this chat, show chat preview. Well, I'll have to come back to it. I can't see it that well. Anyway, um, the second thing you want to do besides building background knowledge is you want to be sure that you teach vocabulary. Now, in terms of teaching vocabulary, the biggest question you're going to ask, whether you're a parent, a teacher, or an educational leader, is how do I decide what words to teach? So I'm going to give you a really simple answer. Teach the important words they don't know. I know, right? It seems simple, but it's the way to think about it. Think, is this word important? How do you decide if it's important? Is it a high utility word? Is it a word they're going to see again? Is it a word that they can learn to build other words from? Like equal, equality, uh, equanimity. So once you learn that word, you can learn a lot of other words. So don't worry about it. Teach the words they don't know and teach words that they need to know. Can you teach them all? No. So don't panic. Just keep those two things in mind. Um, think about vocabulary words that students are going to encounter again and again. So they're going to see this word a lot. If I'm teaching a science unit and they're going to need to know about a cell and the mitosis of cells, those are key words I need to teach them. So when you teach vocabulary as part of this science of reading comprehension, you want to be sure that you sort of keep two big things in mind, that you want to have explicit vocabulary instruction with student-friendly definitions and the images that go with them. And you want to teach students to be word learning machines. So two things, explicit teaching, you want to do that. Secondly, you want students to become word conscious. Now, what do I mean by word conscious under this word learning strategies? Word conscious means that, and some of you probably do this, you sort of listen for words you don't know, whether you're listening to the radio like National Public Radio, or whether you're reading a magazine, or whether you're listening to a conversation, and you say, I don't know what that word means. And you either have someone explain it to you, you read around the word to see if you can learn more about it, or you do what I do and you go, hey, Siri, what does mitosis mean? Oh, by the way, she's turning on right now because I said that. And then you learn what mitosis means. So you want to be able to encourage that with the students or youngsters you have because you want them to sort of always think of themselves as word learners, where they're trying to gather and collect words and collect the meaning of words, because this is why learning vocabulary words is a lifelong endeavor, and we can't teach all the words explicitly. And vocabulary words are the currency. They're the Bitcoin of reading comprehension. Well, Bitcoin's kind of gone downhill, but when Bitcoin was worth a lot, vocabulary words are like the Bitcoin of reading comprehension, meaning they really are the currency that allows you to understand. So if I were going to be really simple about reading comprehension, I would say this to you. It's two things. It's how to read the word. It's knowing what the word means. Honestly. That is like 85% of reading comprehension. Can I read the word? Do I know what it means? So the reason this is important is many of you are spending way too much time worrying about reading comprehension and thinking, I have to find, you know, the 17 reading strategies that my 
children, students need to know, whether I'm in high school, middle school, or elementary school, I have to teach all of these different strategies, otherwise they won't be able to comprehend text. Wrong. Most of reading comprehension is vocabulary slash background knowledge and word reading. Now, there are some things we can do. We can teach vocabulary explicitly, and we need to, and we can teach word learning strategies like morphology and context clues. And I'm gonna talk just a little more about those. So like before you read or before you ask students to read, you want to build background knowledge. Remember I said, don't ask what's your background knowledge, but really build it, give them some information, pictures, videos, explanations, explicit vocabulary instruction, and you want them to kind of have a purpose question for understanding. While they're reading, you want them to ask and answer questions, comprehension monitor with what we refer to in collaborative strategic reading. By the way, I really like collaborative strategic reading, not because my colleagues and I developed it, but because it works. We talk about clunks and a clunk is when you have sort of a comprehension breakdown. So you're reading a text, for example, and you see a word or a sentence and you don't know what it means. We call that a clunk. And it's kind of like, you know, you're going along smoothly while you're reading and then click, you can't understand what's going on. And we really encourage students to think about clunks. Think about when they run into a clunk and how to resolve it. And we actually teach them to do that. And one of the ways we do that is through get the gist. And then after reading, we do a gist, a summary and a wrap up. And so I'm gonna show you a little more about those. So when we talk about vocabulary, remember I said there's the way of making students word conscious and collecting words. We wanna do that, so don't forget it and be interested in words. But we also teach words explicitly. So here's an example of one of the ways we teach a high frequency word explicitly because it comes from social studies and the word is revolution and you can see it's in the middle. Then we have a picture and then we have a student-friendly definition and student-friendly definitions are really hard to find and write. Um, and then we talk about word associations. So is revolution like song? Nope. Is it like war? Yeah, sort of is. Is it like rebellion? Yep, sort of is. Is it like animal? No. So you kind of have an association. It's sort of like war, sort of like re rebellion. You have an example by using a sentence. You have word building. And then we like to activate students around the keyword by turning and talking or having an activity. So if you look at the boxes that represent the word revolution here, each one of these boxes is associated with research, the science of reading, if you will, about how to improve vocabulary instruction. And we've just organized them in this graph so that explicit instruction in vocabulary is visible and readily accessible. And so one of the things that um, we think is important, especially as students move into third grade and above, is morphology. And morphology is the way in which the parts of our language are connected to meaning. So for example, a base word like friend can be made into a morphologically more complex word by adding ly at the end. So you get friendly. And you can make it a, another meaning change by adding un at the beginning. So you get unfriendly. And actually, next to social media, you can get an unfriend. You can unfriend someone. So that by teaching compound words, prefixes, suffixes, and don't forget inflections and root words, you can learn how these elements can be combined in very interesting and complex ways to create meaning. So you get a nice link between word reading and word meaning through morphology. So you want to understand these word parts. And one of the ways you do that is you think about a base word. And so I gave an example earlier of a ba base word, but another example is observe. And then you can have a word like observation. And you can see how you can teach observed and observing. And you can sort of see how these base words allow you to attach morphemes which are the smallest units of language that convey meaning such as plural and S is a morpheme. And so 
you can have um, an opportunity to create much more complex words that students both read. It helps them learn to read those words and it helps them to derive meaning, which improves their comprehension. So you don't wanna teach every prefix. You don't wanna teach every suffix, but there are some common ones that you wanna teach. You wanna be sure you teach like un and re and in, im, er, il, which all mean not dis, and you want to teach non, miss, sub, and pre. You want to teach those because they're common and the meanings are more consistent. So they help students read the words, but they also help students understand what words mean. So there's a lot of good stuff coming up in the chat. I wonder if I can I'm just keep trying to see this chat here. Showed. I still can't see it, but I'll worry about that later. Anyway. Um, Let's move. What's going on? So let's now talk about a few other things related to the science of reading comprehension. Um, we've talked a little bit about the fact that really word reading and word meaning are comprehension. We talked about the fact that when you're really pushing in on comprehension, you want to focus on background knowledge. And the strongest proxy for background knowledge is vocabulary. So anytime you can sort of push in on building vocabulary, whether you're doing that, as I mentioned earlier, explicitly, or whether you're doing that by teaching morphological units, or whether you're doing that the third way. Anybody remember what the third way is? Making students word conscious, powerful. In fact, in many ways, it's the most important way. We want students to be word mongers, word kings and queens who collect words and consider them really valuable and important and practice using them. And as they read, they look for words they don't know. So we know background knowledge is important. We know word reading is important. So let's talk a little bit more about reading comprehension. Let me just say one thing. Reading comprehension practices is a really good example of less is more. Ah, what do I mean by that? What I mean is that many, many people believe that you teach reading comprehension. Listen to this. You don't teach reading comprehension. Reading comprehension is an outcome from your teaching. That really makes a difference. You do teach word reading. You do teach phonological awareness. You do teach phonics, but you don't teach reading comprehension. Reading comprehension is the product of word meaning, things like vocabulary, background knowledge, basically linguistic comprehension and word reading. And so it is the outcome of it. Now you can support it and promote it. And the way you can do that is you can build background knowledge and you can build comprehension, but you don't teach it. So what are some of the ways you can build or enhance comprehension? You can really think about a purpose for reading and getting students to think about some text structures. And my colleague, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Stevens, is probably going to be talking about that in, um, I think it's session number four. This one is session number two. It's session number four. So stay tuned for that. It's going to be really interesting. And then we also want to think about how to model um, reading these text structures. And I'm confident that Elizabeth Stevens is also going to talk about that. Now, here's the other thing. We want to teach students what to do during reading because it is here where many students with reading challenges kind of, if you will, fall asleep while they're reading. And what I mean by that is that they don't really do enough of asking and answering questions while they're reading. Here's a question. You know, I just read that sentence, but I don't remember how that fits in with what I read earlier. Oh, who is this? So you ask questions and you go back and reread. You do repairs. It kind of reminds me of this. Have you ever like on the weekend had a half an hour 
to sit and either read a book or a magazine or a newspaper. Now, I know that might sound like a luxury, but let's pretend you once did that. So you sit and re you're reading and all of a sudden your mind is wandering and you realize you haven't been paying attention to what you've been reading. You're, somehow your eyes are moving over the words because you can read effortlessly, but you're not really putting it together in a way that makes any sense. And so you have to go back and reread it. You have to repair it. One of the things weak readers do not do is they don't ask themselves while they're reading, what's going on? What's happening? Two simple words. If you can encourage your child or the students you teach to just ask yourself that, what's happening? What's going on? You'll improve your reading comprehension. Because really falling asleep while you're reading plowing through words, pushing through text is not reading. It's when you really are engaged in a way that you wonder about what you're reading. That's why the question, what's happening, is really important to teach students to ask themselves. The second thing is, I talked earlier about clunks. You want students to develop this sense of monitoring their comprehension. Do I get it? And if I get a clunk, how do I fix it up? So to really kind of check in. And then the other very important practice that we value, and I'm going to show you how to do, teach this, is get the gist. And basically get the gist is, what's the most important thing? What, what just happened? What's this about? What, did, what should I be learning? And then after you read, you want students to be able to put these gists together to create a summary and to continue with vocabulary and wrapping up. So let's do some examples. Now, when you're reading, the simplest question to teach students to ask is who? So like, who is doing that? Who was the key person? Who is this about? Whether it's narrative text, information text, or hybrid text, who is an easy question to teach students? And by the way, remember, this is so important. So if you're not paying attention to anything else, I'm saying pay attention to this. Whoever does the work while reading is the individual who gets the comprehension. So as the teacher, if you're the one asking all these questions, who was the general of the army? Who were the Caddo Indians? If you're doing all that, you're getting the benefit. So what you want to do is teach children, your students, to ask these questions, to say to themselves, okay, even things like this. Today, the $10 question starts with what? While you're reading, see if you can think of a what question, like what is a colony? And you have to practice this with students, but eventually you can prompt them to look for certain types of questions and to develop them, to wonder about them when they're reading, and then to come back to either a partner, a small group, or the class as a whole and answer. So who questions? what questions, when questions are usually pretty easy too because they're right there in the text, where questions, the two hardest question types are why questions and how questions because they usually involve putting various pieces of the text together to answer the question. But I really encourage you, powerful practice, associated with the science of reading comprehension is to teach youngsters to ask questions while they're reading and in their own heads or after reading to answer them. This question asking is a powerful mechanism for improving reading comprehension. And what you will see in most of your children's classrooms or in students' classrooms is you will see the teacher doing this work. Remember, if the teacher does the work, the teacher becomes a better reading comprehender. I'm pretty sure that's not the goal. The goal is we want students to be better reading comprehenders, so we want them to do the work. So we can model the question types and the corresponding answers. So we can say things like, if I ask a who question, what type of answer will you provide? 
you're going to give me a person or a group. If I ask a where question, what kind of answer will you provide? You're going to do a place. And then you practice writing them. They can practice writing them with a partner until they become more proficient. So these question asking um, practices help you check for understanding. They allow students to learn how to go back to the text to find evidence for the answers. And remember, this is the most important thing. Question generation doesn't fall solely on the teacher. We'll talk more about student-generated questions in the after reading section. So you want students to be able to have various question types and you can give them a card that looks like this. And you can have this card available while they're working on various reading activities. So they remember question types and you can say to them, for example, we have five groups that are reading this passage today. Group one, I want you to come up with a who question. Group two, a what question. Group three, you're going to do a when and a where question, both. Group four, you've got a why question. And group five, you have a how question. So then the groups, as they read the text, develop the question, and then they ask the question to the class as a whole. And then they determine where in the text the answer is. So you can see this sort of um, uh, passing this important role of question generation off to students can be developed and can be developed both in individually and in small groups. In addition to um, asking and answering questions, you know that I mentioned about a clunk. And a clunk is when, and this is what we want students and your children to know, is that it's a word or a phrase that they don't understand. So for example, you get this complex passage like this, Water can be found throughout the earth, both in living things and in the physical environment. What we want students to do is to find the words that are clunks when they read, and they can either write them down or circle them. So in this, one of the clunks might be atmosphere, it might be hydrology, and it might be, um, let's say, uh, some of them might have as a clunk um, environment. Now. Remember, when they have a clunk, one of the things we want to do is to teach them, if they don't know the meaning of the word, to read around the word. Now, when I say read around the word, I mean something like this. So you look at the word hydrology in that sentence, the last one, and you read around the word and it says, the study of the movement and distribution of water on earth is called hydrology. So now, what is hydrology? It's studying how water on earth moves and gets distributed. Okay, now that's hard to put into your own words. That's a pretty complex one. But they might be challenging for your students and all words are not defined within the text. We know that. Oh, by the way, I forgot to say this, really important. You know how some people get really mixed up and they think that when you're teaching word reading, you should use pictures or you should guess the word. And we all know, because the science of reading is very clear on this, that a very ineffective way of teaching students to read words is to guess. Very ineffective. And we're very clear about that. Now, I'm talking about word meaning, not word reading. So when I say sometimes a picture helps, not for reading the word, but for understanding what the word means. So when we talk about clunks, what we're talking about is there's two kinds of clunks. There's clunks where you don't know how to read the word and there's clunks where you don't know what the word means. When you get a clunk where you don't know how to read the word, we want to bring our decoding, our knowledge of decoding, our knowledge of phonics to the word so that we can read it. When we have a word that's a clunk, well, we don't know what it means, then we can use context, we can use pictures, or sometimes we have to use someone who knows what the word means. Now, also during reading, remember, I mentioned that we pay attention to get the gist or the main idea. And so when you want and by the way, you don't want to teach every reading comprehension strategy, but this one is another important one. 
we want to teach students to generate my main ideas by um, helping them understand that the gist. And you can use a cue card like this. You want students to understand the most important who or what in the paragraph. And you want them to know the most important idea about that who or what. Now, we always say write the gist in about 10 words or less. The critical thing isn't whether it's 10 words or less. It's that the student doesn't go on and on and on about it. And we all know students who will do that. They don't know what the word means because they spend way too much time talking about it. So we want to say what the most important who or what is in the paragraph, the most important idea about it, and then to write the gist. And this little cue card will help your students do that. So for example, here's an example of a uh, three students working on fix-up strategies, and they're working on a description and problem solution, and they're practicing the kinds of very simple but straightforward strategies we talked about. So when you get the gist, you want to be sure not only do you have the who or what and uh, the most important thing about it, but you want to be able to put it in their own words. And I hope you know that what I meant is put it in the student's own words, not yours. So I just had to turn on the lights because it just got dark in here. I forgot about the sun setting. Okay, so for example, like if students were reading a passage like this about Benjamin Franklin, and they were reading that Benjamin Franklin thought that working to help people was the best work to do. One way he helped people was by opening a public library. He, they could use the money to buy books. And then he started a library where people could just borrow books. And today, almost every town in the United States has a public library. Okay, now let's practice doing the gist. So who or what is this about? It's Benjamin Franklin. And what is the most important idea about this um, passage, and it's that he started a library so people could borrow and read books. Now, is there only one way to write the gist? Oh, no, there's a lot of ways to write it. But the most important thing is that students learn how to put it in their own words, because that will be the prompt for doing the other things we talked about with respect to the science of reading comprehension, which is to monitor what they read for clunks and to think about what's this about while they're reading. That's the essence of it. The purpose of Get the Gist is to sort of, again, get students to think about what they're reading. So if you were going to do a Get the Gist practice, you might take a passage like this from William Shakespeare, and you might have students read this, and then you might have them pair up and practice um, talking about what the most important uh, who or what is, in this case, it's Shakespeare, and what the most important thing about this passage is. And then you might want to have uh, partners share their gists. So you could have four students, partners uh, sharing with each other, and then you could have them then compose a gist that takes advantage of the two gists that were already written. So this is a way to improve their ability to write gists. And so um, we talked so far about what you could do before reading, like building background knowledge and vocabulary. And then we talked about what you could do during reading, like asking and answering questions, being sure to teach students to think about clunks and get the gist. And now we're gonna talk a little bit about what you can do after reading. Now, I think you probably remember that I said, one of the um, most challenging things is to um, teach too many strategies. That's why I wanna organize them very clearly for you. So you teach the ones that are associated with the science of reading comprehension. And so once students learn how to write GIS, the next uh, practice or strategy that is really helpful for them is to learn how to put these GIS together in a summary. So, um, we're going to talk a little bit about how you do that. So if you look at this um, slide, what you'll see that this slide tries to portray is that if students were reading a longer passage, they might have, for example, four gists. 
So for example, a gist might come from a long paragraph or perhaps two shorter paragraphs. And so if students were reading maybe eight to 10 paragraphs, you could have four different gists. And each of these gists can then inform a summary. So when you write a summary, which really is the way of putting it all together, is that you write a topic sentence, you write supporting details, and you write a concluding sentence. Now, hold on. Some of you might be saying to yourself, oh my gosh, I never do this. I have good reading comprehension and I don't do all of this. You're absolutely right. Would we expect students to write gists for every paragraph or a couple of paragraphs they read? In a two letter word answer, no, we would not. The exercises that we're doing right now, the GIST exercise and the summary of GIST exercise is designed to, if you will, practice these reading comprehension strategies so that students have them in their repertoire and when they're reading texts and not applying the GIST directly or not writing summaries, their brain automatically does that because that's what good readers do. Even though you don't write a gist or I don't write a gist, when we're reading, especially if we're reading something we want to understand, learn, or remember, we do little summaries in our head so that we can remember these things. And what we're doing for students who are more challenged or, or who are novices with respect to reading comprehension is that we're helping them if you will, secure these same practices in their repertoire so that when they're not doing it deliberately, they're doing it inferentially. So this exercise about just to summary is something students would practice so that they get better at using it independently. So that's when you write the topic sentence about who or what is the entire passage about, you write the supporting details and you can garner those from the gist that you had, as I mentioned earlier. So you can pull from these gists to create your summary and you write a concluding sentence. Teaching students to do this is a very powerful way to improve the way in which they think about text when they're reading independently. Therefore, you're promoting the science of reading comprehension. So, for example, here's Oops, sorry. Here are several gists that were taken from a passage. This is about Singapore. And I used this example recently, actually, when I was working for the Singapore Ministry of Education. And I was explaining to them because they're using collaborative strategic reading, the practices that I'm showing you tonight about the science of reading. They're using them all over Singapore as part of their Ministry of Education because they very much support the science of reading, both in terms of the science of word reading and in terms of the science of reading comprehension. So in this one, I used a passage that came right from Singapore. Sir Thomas Stamford Raffles founded modern Singapore in the 19th century. Singapore was already an up and coming trading post in the region and the city grew, uh, uh, at, excuse me, attracting immigrants from China, India, and Malaysia. And so now if I was going to write a summary statement, I would write a topic sentence, I would write supporting details, and I would write a concluding sentence using all of my gists. So now that you have a sense of what reading comprehension is, you have a sense of what you might do before reading. You now know what to do during reading. You're not going to use a million strategies. You're going to use things like uh, teaching vocabulary words, building background knowledge. You're going to do things like teaching students to recognize clunks, how to write gists, and then they're going to learn how to use these gists to write summaries. Now, after reading vocabulary and follow-up, so what happens then? So one of the things we like to do is we like to go back, because remember I said to you, background knowledge is the big kahuna of reading comprehension. Other than word reading, which you gotta have, then understanding what the words mean is the big thing. 
So in addition to teaching vocabulary before students read, we teach vocabulary after they read. We say, what was an important word that will help us better understand and hold on to what we read? The way to kind of think about it is think about one or two words that are sort of the Velcro that will allow various other words and ideas to stick so that they can remember and not just understand, but learn from what they read. The example I provide here is the word abundance. And with the word abundance, this was a critical word in a passage we were working on in Singapore. And we decided that if students understood abundance in the passages that they were working on, it would help them sort of hold the meaning together of the entire passage. So I said to you earlier, when you use a um, graph like this one, what's valuable about it is you don't need all of the components, but all of these components have been associated with understanding and retaining keywords. So whether it's the definition in a user-friendly way, associations like we did with the word associations, in this case, abundance, the word associations would be shortage, plenty, vegetables, or quantity. Now, a lot of people put, uh, select vegetables because there's a picture of vegetables, but the picture is designed to portray an abundance of vegetables. It could be an abundance of anything. Of course, an example, and then we always like to put it in practice with a turn and talk. We also like to have a wrap up. Now, when we mean wrap up about reading comprehension, we're really talking about the, going back to some of those practices that we talked about earlier and putting them together, like asking questions. Remember I said to you, we want to teach students to ask the questions. We might even ask them to ask particular types of questions, like a what question or a where question. We might ask them to write it on an index card. And then when we read the entire passage, either in small groups or pairs or by themselves, we can do a wrap up in which we say, okay, each of you has a question. Um, take turns asking your question to the class as a whole and see if they can answer it. And it also helps improve question asking. So they don't have to ask 10 questions. They can ask one question or two questions. It really helps them remember what they read and helps them learn from it. And it also serves as a way to review what was just read. So One of the other ways we work very hard to promote reading comprehension, in addition to the practices we just talked about, we like to have students work in groups because we think reading comprehension, we don't think it, we know it from research. Reading comprehension really comes together better and more efficiently when students have a chance to talk about it and to work with each other about it. So Doing things like get the gist and vocabulary maps and summarization can be done solo, but they can also be done in small groups and pairs. Um, I want to give you some really important closing thoughts about the science of reading comprehension. First of all, I want to say that um, if we want to know how to really improve reading comprehension, Oops, sorry. One of the ways we can do that is we can provide interventions for students. And if I ask many of you, are you in your right now in your schools, are parents, is your child involved in an intervention around reading comprehension? You might say yes. And I would say to you, this is really important. Reading comprehension interventions will always be necessary but they will also always be inadequate. In order to really improve reading comprehension, you need school-wide approaches to enhancing these pressure points. What I mean by that is that all teachers in the school need to use the practices we just learned about 
to promote the science of reading comprehension. You cannot rely on intervention teachers to do it all. Every teacher, whether it's the first grade teacher, the fifth grade teacher, the middle school teacher, or the high school teacher, whether it's the social studies teacher or the English language arts teacher, these comprehension practices are not for intervention alone, but they are part of the school-wide approach. Here's the other thing about reading comprehension. Without enhanced word reading, in other words, we do have to make sure students have the foundations of word reading, vocabulary and background knowledge, reading comprehension will remain underdeveloped. That's why it's a school-wide mission. So whether you're a parent or a teacher or a principal, the practices that I talked about today are ones that I encourage you to integrate school-wide. The second platform is that reading comprehension has to go across the entire content area. So we need school-wide approaches for enhancing vocabulary, background knowledge, and reading comprehension, not just in third grade English language arts, not just in fifth grade reading, but social studies and science. And you know who we really uh, are very successful at get, getting to teach some of these vocabulary and comprehension practices is the math teachers. So all across. The second, the next platform is that we need to have purposeful peer interaction. So if you say to teachers, how often do you use peer pairing or small groups to support reading comprehension? I can tell you what the answer is. The answer is all the time. How often do you do this? All the time. Observation studies after observation studies show that purposeful peer interaction, purposeful small group interaction is inadequately used. And when I say purposeful, I mean they're doing something on purpose. They're not just working in a group to figure out a worksheet or to answer a silly question. It has real meaningful activities like the ones I talked about tonight. Platform number three, this is super important. I put it in two words. The words are more reading. I just got to tell you, deliberate practice is the secret sauce to success around reading. We are not going to have our children become better readers if they don't read. You walk into classrooms and teachers are doing all the work. Guess what? They already know how to read. Until we have opportunities to use text as a source for word reading, vocabulary, and knowledge building, we are going to inadequately improve reading comprehension. Platform number four, the reading strategies should be taught, but not too many. It's like Goldilocks. Not too few, not too many. Just the ones I told you about. Don't teach a million of them. You just waste students' cognitive uh, capacity to use the strategies if they have too many. Platform number five. Never, ever, ever think that you can develop reading comprehension by not adequately supporting foundation school skills. Very important. Word reading is the pathway to reading comprehension. I said that earlier. You can't avoid it. So if you ask people, this happens to me all the time. People say, I come to the school. I say, what are your problems? You know what they always say? Reading comprehension. Reading comprehension is a problem. But you find out that the reason reading comprehension is the problem is because the students can't read the words. Believe me, that's not a reading comprehension problem. That's a word reading problem. So we need to know how to read the words and we need to know what they mean. Word reading, word meaning is the pathway to reading comprehension. Don't forget that. It's in bold. It's on this slide. Don't forget it. It's essential. Now, I have a takeaway message for you. You ready for this? In order to significantly improve reading comprehension, 
please utilize the school-wide platform that I just talked about. It cannot be done 30 minutes a day, 45 minutes a day by one intervention teacher. If the entire school is not utilizing the science of reading, the burden on the few teachers who are far exceeds capacity and students will make inadequate progress. So if you have teachers and educational leaders who are saying things like, we started an intervention and people told me it was a structured literacy intervention and that it would be associated with improved outcomes, but actually um, it didn't work and it's not working. Take a look at what's happening the rest of the day. 30 to 45 minutes a day is not going to do it. We need school-wide platforms. We need ongoing intensive interventions at the word level and word meaning level. And we need to understand that reading comprehension is fundamentally a result, a product. Remember I said you don't teach reading comprehension? It's a product of knowledge, word reading, practice reading, and discussing texts. So, wow. Thank you all for listening for so long. I really, it was so great to spend this time with you. And now I'm super excited about looking at the chat. How do I see this chat? Can somebody help me do yeah, that? I'm not sure. You might not be able to see it because you're the presenter. Oh, can you make That's me not? About. Oh, wait a minute. I think I just got it. Oh, okay. I might oh have. my goodness. There are. Did you get it? I yeah. I also think if your if your presentation is full screen, Sharon, that it will be oh. difficult to see. You to minimize and not minimize it, but make it smaller so that you can actually try that. Okay, let me see what I can do here. Okay, um, you know, I've only been doing this for like two years. You'd think I'd be a pro by now, right? Okay, let me see. I think I just did it. All right, how uh, so? Chat people. Porn in the chat. Let me just um, tell you a couple of things that I want to talk about because these questions kept coming. So one of the questions that I've heard like a lot is how can we assess reading comprehension? And even more importantly, how can we progress monitoring uh, reading comprehension? So first of all, assessing reading comprehension is very difficult. There are a lot of tests of reading comprehension they give us an indication of reading comprehension, but reading comprehension is very difficult to assess. Um, the main way that reading comprehension is assessed is that youngsters are asked to read almost always silently a passage, typically a fairly short passage, and then they're asked a series of questions. And these questions, are typically like test questions, even more than reading comprehension questions. So the, the reading of all of the reading measures we have, whether it's phonological awareness, phonics, word reading, fluency, vocabulary, the weakest measures we have are measures of reading comprehension. So they certainly give us an indication. They're certainly better than nothing, but I don't find them very diagnostic. So I, if I want to have a diagnostic measure that will actually help me understand students' reading comprehension, I like retell. I find asking students to retell what they just read is very helpful. But that's a very complex way. It's hard to score. And it's particularly hard to do if you have to do it with a lot of students. But for me, if I'm doing an intervention with a small group, I like retail. The second question I got is that, I, and by the way, I'm talking about questions that came up a lot. One of them is, how should we teach reading comprehension in uh, kindergarten, first and second grade? Okay. So let me just say a couple of things. After I've just given this talk, most of you know what I'm about to say about reading comprehension. One is that we don't teach reading comprehension. So the question is, how do we develop reading comprehension in kindergarten through second grade? So I bet you know what I'm going to say there too. Number one, 
develop decoding and word reading because if students can read the words, they've come a long way for reading comprehension. So if they can decode and read the words, that's important. Secondly, do you remember what I said is an important and necessary indicator of reading comprehension? Remember what I said? I said background knowledge and vocabulary is a proxy for background knowledge. So with kindergarten, first and second graders, what you want to do is you want to do read alouds with them that are several grade levels above the grade level they're in because the read aloud you're going to do. So I've got five-year-olds in front of me, right? And these five-year-olds can't read complex text. They're just learning to read. But I wanna build their capacity for comprehension in the future. The way to do that is to read text above their level because your listening comprehension is significantly higher then you're reading comprehension. And you want to use nutritious reading that will build background knowledge and vocabulary. So in the early grades, before students can access complex text, the, you lean on word reading, word meaning, and then reading comprehension practices with more difficult text than they can read, okay? So, now, those were two questions that came up. I have a whole bunch of other questions, but we've got this big chat going, some of which I can actually read. Uh, let me see. I'm wondering what you think about the transfer of these practices and the knowledge you mentioned to English as a foreign language students or English as a second language or English learners. Let me tell you something. The science of reading, whether it's the science of word reading are the science of reading comprehension is universal. It's not for one group of students, but not another. It is for all students. So do the practices that I talked about, are they applicable for English learners and EFL students? Absolutely, yes. Does that mean we do no customization? Of course not, we customize just like we would customize for students with dyslexia. But these principles, and this is so important, are universal. So as smart and careful and thoughtful teachers, we think about who we teach and we think about how we customize and respond to them. And that's very important. And we think about their cultural and linguistic diversity and how we might make adjustments so that it is the best situated instruction for them. But the overall practices, the truths I speak about the science of reading comprehension are not specific or unique to a particular population. So thank you so much for asking that question, because I think it's really important. Um, Hetty Allen says, um, in a read aloud, I take it you mean the teacher is reading to the students. That's correct. That's exactly what I meant. Um, Let's see. I think who's helping me here? Is that supposed to be Nicole? Are you helping? That me? is me. Yeah. Hey, Nicole, help right. me out. Are there some other good questions here I ought to be jumping on? Yeah, there definitely are. Um, so there was one that came up pretty early on. So I don't think you saw it, but it was when you were talking about um, teaching background knowledge and not just throwing that blanket statement out there, asking children what they know. Somebody asked about that strategy that is that KWL strategy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So what would you say about that? So, so here's the part of KWL I think needs to be fixed. The what do you know? Because if you're trying to teach a new word or a new concept, you would not expect students to know about it because otherwise, why are you wasting instructional time teaching it? Choose something they don't know. There's plenty of that. We all know. There's plenty of words they don't know. There's plenty of ideas they don't know. So I prefer, and I think the research would suggest this, that unless you have a lot of strong uh, background knowledge students who are going to build the background knowledge of other students, that case, I would go with it. But that's not the kind of classrooms I'm teaching in. Most of the time, they're ones where I need to bring that background knowledge to students. So just think about who you're teaching and whether that's relevant. That's, thank you for that. Another question that came up 
a couple of different times. So um, I'm going to combine it and just yeah. ask this. And the question is, when you are working with students who are struggling with word recognition skill and they are struggling with vocabulary and comprehension, how do you how do you manage the time in, in terms of what do you do? What do you focus on first? Or how do you manage what you're going to do for that student? I love that question that I just want to like stand up and applaud because I, I think this is really important. You know how I said earlier, a lot of people say when I ask them, what is your biggest problem in your school, in your classroom? They say reading comprehension. However, more than 80% of students with reading comprehension problems also have word reading problems. They don't just have reading comprehension problems. They have word reading problems. And that's kind of what this, this question recognizes. They're saying to me, hey, peeps, we don't just have reading comprehension problems. We got them both. How do we set up our time? How do we set up our program? Okay, so here's the answer. You get to teach both. It's the privilege of teaching students with challenges. You don't get to pick just reading comprehension. You don't get to pick just word reading. And so do you have enough time? No. That's why I said you have to have school-wide practices where this is done all day, every day, in every classroom. Now, if it's only left up to you for a 30 or 45 minute period a day, you can't do it. And so in those cases, no throwing tomatoes at me through the screen. And those cases where I had students for a short period of time, I would focus on word reading. And the reason I would is because the likelihood they're going to get adequate instruction in word reading outside of my group is about 10%. They will get the vocabulary instruction. They may get the comprehension instruction, but I have to build that word reading. So I would privilege that. Now, did you hear me just say, I wouldn't teach reading comprehension? I didn't say that. I said, you have to make choices. What I really want is school-wide practices. That's what I really want to see. Okay, what else have you got there? And well, that, um, that, that kind of segues into a question that came in earlier. This was before the webinar started. And the question was about this. The science of reading kind of has a reputation, I guess, right now out there in the field that it's all about decoding. And so this presentation is called the science of reading comprehension. How, how does that work together? What would what could you bring back to your school or your district and say, no, listen, it's more than decoding. And this is why. Yeah, I have heard that too. Honestly, I think it's just like, in some ways, it's sort of like, we have overemphasized, I don't know who the we in that sentence is, but we've probably overemphasized decoding phonics, word reading, it, as we talk about the science of reading. But the reason we have is because it has been inadequately taught. I mean, it's not our fault that people have been using practices that are not aligned with the science of reading when it comes to teaching, decoding, and word reading. So we've had to lean in on that a little bit. Also, I think it's because we have assumed that reading comprehension practices have been well taught. And I think that as I hope you have taken away from my presentation, that's not true. So as we get more comfortable recognizing that the science of reading is of course, word reading and phonics, but it's also vocabulary, fluency. We didn't talk about fluency tonight. You know, fluency is really important. We should have a session on that. We need to have a whole session just on fluency because that is really important. People just think it's repeated reading over and over again until kids like are ready to like stop reading. But um, the point about the science of reading is that it's what we have learned about how we develop readers. It's what we have learned about the way the brain functions. I mean, first of all, people get so confused they think that language and reading are the same thing. 
And they are so different. Like we are hardwired as human beings. Our brains are hardwired to acquire language. You know, interestingly enough, hey, you know what, Nicole? If you and I were born in Paris and grew up in Paris to French speaking parents, guess what language we would speak? It's not English. So, well, what I mean is we're hardwired. If we're exposed to language, we're going to learn language. We're language learning machines. Learning to read is a relatively recent thing for our brain to have processed. We're not hardwired in the same way. We need to be taught to read. And so because of that, and because we've been pushing against that for so many decades, and people have been developing practices that lean on reading, developing naturally, which are inadequate, we have had to emphasize word reading. But the science of reading is how reading develops, and that includes all the components of reading. I don't know if that's helpful, but what yeah. do you think? I think that's very helpful. Um, so it's funny you said uh, repeated reading because actually Wendy posted a question and her question was, what are your thoughts about repeated reading in the framework of comprehension? Yeah, so, um, oh gosh. So remember, I have like, I think like you need to do like a whole thing on fluency. Okay, so Wendy Fluency, oral reading fluency, particularly in the early grades, particularly below fifth grade, is an excellent indicator of comprehension. So second grade, third grade, fourth grade, students' oral reading fluency predicts reading comprehension exceedingly well. And it's because at those early grades, word reading and, and doing it effortlessly allows these young children's minds to think about what they're reading. So as they be, are able to read these words automatically, that's what fluency is, automatically, and with ease, they are able to then free up all these cognitive resources to think about what they're reading so their reading comprehension improves. And that's really true in the younger grades because of something really important. It's because, remember when I talked about the definition of reading comprehension? It's because the background knowledge in first grade, second grade, and third grade is not very complex, right? So the load for reading comp comprehension can really come from the indicators like oral reading fluency. But as students get older, then the text becomes more loaded with complex vocabulary and comprehension that fluency, while still important, doesn't play as significant a role because background knowledge and vocabulary play more of a role. So... I don't know, Wendy, whether I answered your question, but I hope so. Well, that was, I thought that was a good answer. I'm sure Wendy's going, yay, thank you. Well, um, Nicole, did I get a B plus on that answer? Oh, I'll give you an A, definitely. I did. That, was, that was good, yeah. And I'm keeping score. I'm, I got it all going on here. Um, I hope I didn't haven't gotten any Cs yet. No, uh-uh. <laughs> Okay, good. <laughs> so here's, here's a question that I think um, a lot of people were wondering in, in, in kind of in different ways, but it's about what is the difference between skills and strategies and mm -hmm. processes? Like somebody was saying, what about magna, metacognitive, you know, processes or thinking this or versus a skill versus a strategy? Ah, oh man. Can we just like, come up with an easier one? Like, can I just do like a pass? Now that's a really good question. Seriously, it is a good question. So um, I might even think something, who asked that question, by the way? I have kind of been three oh, different okay. questions yeah. that came oh, in. Okay. And so yeah. it's really a lot of, this was a lot of people, maybe even more, but at least three okay. people were circling around this one. I got you. I just wanted to kind of address the person, but anyway, I'll address the world. So. I might answer this differently like in two months because I find this such a hard question. Basically, a skill to me is something readily observed. So for example, you could have a skill for segmenting 
a word into phonemes. It's readily observed. You could have a skill, for example, for blending um, syllables into words. You could have a skill, for example, of um, reading words correctly at a particular rate, okay? Like oral reading fluency, that's a skill. To me, a strategy is less visible. So for example, I might want you to have the strategy of using a clunk when you read. I can't see you do that, okay? I can model it. I can have you practice it. I can ask you to tell me what your clunk was, but I can't watch your brain try to find clunks while you read. It's invisible to me. So I sort of view, by the way, and I, and I don't, like I said, I'm kind of making this up, but this is my operational definition. Skills are more observable, more discreet. Um, strategies are more clustered, less visible. And then what was the third one? processes oh i don't have any idea what a process is so um like the idea of metacognition like thinking oh. about thinking as you're comprehending text i guess i think of that's more of a strategy i maybe a process and a strategy kind of are pretty much the same thing to me you might be able to give me an example where i would say oh that is different but mm -hmm. mostly i think it's the same thing okay that's good to know question came in um, from Lawrence. And this question was, when using retell as a way to measure comprehension, how do you interpret a child that struggles finding words? So yeah. they're going to oversimplify because they don't have the word. Yeah, that's a, gosh, you guys are so good. These are excellent questions. So, you know, like everything we have to do when we teach students that have challenges is we have to customize. So in the case that you just provide, I wouldn't use retail because it disadvantages the student, right? And anytime we are trying to learn what a student knows and can do, we want to advantage them, not disadvantage them. So I don't know that particular student, but I would think of ways to do it so that I would not disadvantage them. So I agree with you, that would be a problem. And I wouldn't use retail in that condition unless I could support them. If I could figure out a way to scaffold and support them, then I would. Okay, so here you go. Nicole, you're gonna to have to come up with your best last question because- Oh then my I'm gosh, finished. well that's- I not... haven't had dinner. I'm hungry, you guys. I know, but just to give you perspective, right now I'm looking at 33 new messages that are popping in and I didn't oh. even get through the list. So let me see. Hey, um, by the way, you guys, you are all terrific. I love your questions. I love how engaged you are. I have no idea how you found these people, but you should just send them all to Austin so I can work with them. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we've actually, you've covered a good bit of this. It's oh, wow. I think we've done, a, you have done a wonderful job of answering most of these questions. Well, let me just say something to parents. Mm -hmm. Parents, let me just say this to you. I am on your side. You have such a, a challenging job, both parenting and mentoring and finding the pathway for uh, your child children. And I just want you to know that you cannot both be the parent, the mentor, the guide, and the teacher. So we really owe you, at the very least, to use the science of reading in our schools so that the hard job you have is the only job that you have. I just wanna thank all of you so much. Such a privilege to be here with you. And I just wanna thank um, IDA Georgia and the Reading League Georgia. You guys are so awesome. Most of you are volunteers. Most of you do this on your own time. And I'm, I, we just couldn't be where we are with the science of reading without you. And so from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much. Um, thank you very, very much, Dr. Vaughn. I mean, tonight's presentation was absolutely wonderful. If you do see the chat, there are so many people saying it was one of the best webinars they've ever attended, ever. So 
Um, we really appreciate it. We definitely appreciate all that you shared tonight. And thanks to everyone out there who joined us this evening. I know that we've all learned a good bit more about how to improve our students' um, understanding of text. Um, I just wanna say to everyone as well, if you have colleagues who missed tonight's webinar, please let them know that there will be a link that will be emailed within 24 to 48 hours so that they can watch the recording and they will also receive Dr. Vaughn's presentation slides. Also, all re registrants will have the opportunity to fill out a knowledge check request for a certificate of attendance after viewing either the webinar tonight live or the recorded version. And that form will be sent early next week and registrants will have approximately one week to submit it. Those who do fill out the form will receive their certificate of attendance the day after the deadline for submission. And then I just wanna say that our next webinar on the Spotlight on Structured Literacy Series will be on Wednesday, March 1st at 7 p.m. The speakers will be Drs. Vroom and Zolio from The Writing Revolution, and their presentation is called The Writing Revolution, an Overview of the Hockman Method, and they will focus on an explicit set of specific writing strategies that teachers can use in every grade and in every subject, as well as the connection between reading and writing. So please visit the IDA Georgia's website to register for that upcoming presentation. And thank you so much. And thank you again, Dr. Vaughn, for um, joining us all this evening and have a wonderful rest of your night and definitely go get some dinner. <laughs> <laughs> Bye everybody, thanks. Thanks so much. <laughs>